This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, everybody's got their microphones uh, muted. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, I'm very um, happy to introduce Thomas, who's going to talk about the Skydem project today. If you have any questions as we go along, if you'd like to pop them in the chat pane and I'll collate them as we go along, and then I'll uh, I'll ask those questions to Thomas at the end. And we intend to be finished by 1 p.m. today, so that's two days. So without any further ado, I shall hand over to my colleague, uh, Thomas, over to you. Okay, uh, yes, thank you very much, Shirley. Um, right, let me, now can everybody see the uh, PowerPoint okay? I hope. Right, so yes, uh, my name is Thomas Morton. I uh, am a research associate uh, working for the uh, ADS, uh, that's the University of Worcester. And I'm here today to talk about the uh, sustainable community interventions for people affected by dementia or the SkyDem project, uh, as it's known. Now, this is a project that I've been working on along with my colleagues, uh, Teresa Atkinson, and it's led by Dawn Brooker, uh, this project. And we've also had input from uh, yeah, Clive Kennard, who is an information specialist on the search and uh, also guidance from Jeff Wong, who is a expert in realist research from the University of Oxford. Now, what is the SkyDem project, first of all? Okay, well, the problem we're looking at is to do with uh, social isolation, loneliness and stigma. We know that these are widespread issues for people living with dementia and their families and can impact significantly on both mental and physical health. Now, we also know community based support for people with dementia and their care partners, such as regularly meeting groups and activities, can play an important part in post diagnostic care uh, from combating isolation, maintaining positive self image to delaying decline and hospitalization. But also, in countries such as this one, uh, these kind of community based uh, initiatives are typically delivered piecemeal by a variety of agencies with inconsistent funding and this has led to fragmented provision with significant gaps and critically and this is what we're looking at to add to this many such interventions find they're unable to continue after only a very short period of time and of course uh, the we started the skydem uh, project 18 months ago and of course this so the data we're working on is pre covid era but of course the uh, yeah the situation with the lockdown and covid has just made this all the more well all the more acute and all the more you know urgent to be tackling really and has added quite a curveball into things so um, so that's also something that we will be well we'll talk about a little bit later so the aims for the SkyDem review, uh, well, we're investigating what can promote or hinder community interventions being able to sustain, sustain over time. I should say by community interventions, I pretty much mean anything that is a group or activity that is uh, that that is designed to to target or serve people who are affected by dementia, and that includes people with dementia and their uh, family carers, and uh, that's. Uh, so groups and activities essentially that are based in the community so what we're not talking about is people going into people's homes we're talking about people coming out of their homes to gather together now of course again in this climate currently that is a bit of a challenge of course but of course these uh, uh, initiatives can work virtually as well so we are gathering and synthesizing data on this subject from a wide range of sources we published something called a project protocol uh, last year. Now that was basically a, uh, a a paper that just says this is what we are going to do. This is our study before we've done it. And by the end of rev the review, we want to be able to report on how we can best implement community based interventions so that they are sustainable. We want to produce tips and recommendations both to people in practice and for policymakers. And we also want to create accessible publications and online materials aiming to provide uh, evidence-based guidance for others. So SkyDem is something called a realist review. 
Uh, now I'm aware that that term isn't something that's commonly known by everybody and uh, it's yeah. particularly to do with the kind of approach we're taking. So what is a realist review? Now the realist approach, there are various types of studies you can do as uh, taking a realist approach and why what we mean in this case is realist refers to aiming to reveal the cause and effect mechanisms behind human activity in complex systems. So complex systems, a complex system can be something like a social care program. It could be something like a particular health in intervention. It could be any kind of activity that people do around something. So we're looking to identify how different contexts, that's background circumstances, can trigger different mechanisms, that's processes in people and organization, uh, organizations to produce different outcomes. And what this involves is approaching the data using something called a realist logic of analysis. Now that sounds uh, scarily complicated, but basically all it is is tracing the cause and effect chains that that we think are, well, basically how circumstances might trigger certain mechanisms in people and organizations to create certain outcomes. So it's, it's basically we're tracing cause and effect is the idea to create a theoretical model, which we call a program theory, uh, that tells you basically how something works, a group or activity works under different circumstances. So you might take a particular, say, a walking group that uh, you've ori was originally designed to work for people in urban Birmingham, and seeing how that then works in rural Wales. And it's so, so it, it's it's that kind of thing that we're looking at: the differences in context and how that affects things. So a realist review is where a realist approach is taken to gathering and synthesizing data from existing literature. So you can take a realist approach to doing a, a study where you actually go into a place and interview people and observe things. In this case, we're doing a review of data that has been published in various things, uh, articles of various types out there already in the world. And the idea is we do a realist review to build up a theory from the data already out there and hopefully we're hoping to be able to go on and then do a study where we actually go to uh, study groups in the field as it were. So what have we done so far? Now that's a very complex diagram there on the right um, but as basically you can see that what it really involves is searching for data uh, so searching through lots of different articles and papers and so on and then trying to put it all together or synthesize it. So throughout, we have been uh, approaching various people who are involved in such groups and activities uh, at various levels, whether that's uh, that's uh, whether that's running and managing, whether that's uh, attending, or whether that's uh, planning or governance and so on. So the idea is that we can yeah we can take a little bit of steer from people who have some expert knowledge about uh, such things, but then we get to searching. So what we've done is we found 69 articles through formal searching. Formal searching means uh, we had like a systematic uh, search that we did on various databases, uh, mainly of academic papers, but also things like newspaper articles, blogs, um, all kinds of different uh, articles out there. And we also found 54 articles through informal search methods. And this is quite an important difference with the usual kind of um, systematic review that researchers do, is that we're not just interested in, um, in purely academic studies and so on. We're actually looking for articles of all kinds of uh, all different types. And we can include articles that have just been recommended by people or things that have been referred to in other articles that we then go on and find. So half, almost half of what we found has been found, found informally as well. Then what we did was we went through all those articles and we looked for passages that were relevant and we extracted those relevant articles that said something about how you keep a um, a group or activity going and then we've themed them so we've coded them by what kind of thing they um, talk about and then we organized them and assessed how relevant they were or how rigorous that kind of information was or how reliable is that information and then ultimately we ended up with 61 articles that was whittled down to from those 69 plus 54 uh, that were assessed to be of medium to high relevance or rigor 
And then we went looking at that data that we gathered for looking for the cause and effect mechanisms. So that's all the complicated stuff. So basically, um, this next bit is just yeah, an overview of what we've actually found, which is, of course, what everyone's interested in, really. So this here is a diagram that shows uh, a kind of overview of what we found in the data. You can see there are four key areas that uh, lead to well, that affects the sustainability of a community based group or activity that we found. So they involve getting members and keeping members, getting staff and volunteers and keeping staff and volunteers, uh, keeping getting the support of other organizations and keeping the support of other organizations. And now I should say other organizations could mean charitable organizations, it could mean local authority, uh, it, or it could mean uh, yeah, NHS services, or it could mean yeah, referrers of all different types. Or just, or even rival organisations who are doing something similar to yourself, you know, making sure that you work together rather than against each other, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, there's keeping funding, getting funding, and keeping funding, which is uh, absolutely key as well. I'll just zoom in on those uh, a little bit more. So, yeah, I won't go into these in depth, but you can see that there are various factors there that feed into the air, the areas of getting members and keeping members. And then we have getting staff and volunteers and keeping staff and volunteers. And keeping the support of other organizations and getting the support of other organizations in the first place. And finally, funding and income. So that's an overview. But I should say the point of realist research is not just to get a list of factors and issues, because, of course, I'm sure people know the, the factors and issues that affect them. What we're really interested in is teasing out a little more nuanced detail on what the cause and effect is. And that's the point. So we're looking at what what can cause what so that we can make recommendations to people who are starting up groups or activities or people who are struggling to keep going and suggest things that might possibly be helpful to them so this so here are a few example recommendations that we have made now there's a lot of recommendations that have come out of this so i'm only going to go through a few and just give some examples of how we've kind of come to those so on the subject of getting members one of the recommendations we arrived at was that that's a group or activity should emphasize the social aspects of your intervention or group or activity and include food and refreshments where possible for wide appeal. The reason why we said that was because our data tells us that if the social aspect of an intervention is emphasized, that's the, uh, the context or background circumstances, then a wider range of people are likely to be interested. That's the outcome. And that's because a desire for social connection and activity is more universal than interest in a niche and potentially intimidating activity and that's the mechanism now that will have come from multiple articles that we've looked at in our search and it, it, it's something that you find a lot across the board of different types of activities and groups saying very similar things is that if you're a little bit too focused on just the activity and you ignore the social aspect of it, that can put people off actually. And if you have a, a social activity that, uh, if you emphasize the social aspect, then people can come along, even if they're not massively interested in the activity, they can still want to come along for the social aspect of it. So it's, it's quite key to getting members in the first place. But then we can add to that. So yeah, sorry, I should go back through that again. So we've got a, uh, that's the, context outcome and mechanism there that's just one of the context mechanism outcome uh, statements that we've got leading to this recommendation because there are others so we can add to that that if food is offered this is something else we found in sometimes the same article sometimes other articles then people are more likely to attend because enjoyment of good food is universal and communal eating is associated with comfort, relaxation and social connection. So again, food is quite a key area. So you put those two things together and then you start to get, uh, yeah, you get something a li little more uh, nuanced and fleshed out. Again, we will have, we've done this for all of these recommendations and we will have multiple context outcome mechanism configurations for each one. 
So just another a quick example uh, in keeping members, the stability and the reliability of the service really matters to members or service users. So it's a good idea to aim for structure and minimize disruption to the service. Now, I know that's easier said than done, uh, but there are a lot of factors pointing towards that, that this is quite a, a key thing. So one of them is that our data tells us that if the sessions are regular, routine and structured, then members will be more likely to keep coming as they will feel secure in the familiarity and the reliability of the proceedings. If you have the place keeps changing, the timings keep changing, that can be one reason why people drop out, that they, they just they can't keep on top of it or they forget about it or they just, you know, it's too much effort to, uh, to keep going. So that's how we've arrived at our recommendations. So to finish up, I was just going to go through, uh, well, essentially a few more of the recommendations, but I won't go into the, the background of the context mechanism outcome configurations. As I say, once this is done, then if anyone wants to have a look at the full results, then then by all means get in touch with me and uh, we can, uh, yeah, we can, yeah, let you know. But we do have a little bit of work yet to be doing. So on the uh, getting members, so extra recommendations we have for getting members include ensuring a warm welcoming non-stigmatizing introduction to the service or group or activity and that involves strong staff interpersonal skills and an appealing venue we found that uh, fostering understanding and support from attendees trusted friends family and health professionals was quite key uh, the encouragement of people to go along that could be something that really swayed things in getting members and then ensuring people can get there easily, safely, reliably and cheaply. Actually, I think that was one of the biggest factors was transport, that transport alone can be the thing that scuppers people from coming along. They might really want to come, but if it's just too expensive or just too awkward or just not reliable, then that they won't they won't try. And then, yes, keeping members, we have being person centred. So that is uh, yeah, giving members input into planning and decision making and respecting their individual needs and autonomy and being sensitive to differences in abilities, ages and stages. So that involves having strategies to differentiate and manage activities so that people's needs don't clash. That can be that's something that came up quite a lot in that people felt that uh, particularly with people feeling that the group or activity is for them and not for other people. They can people can become both in, in getting members and in keeping members, but in keeping members, certainly uh, people can start to feel that that others needs are being prioritized over their own, that uh, that the group is not really for them. And that can be a reason why people drop out. So yes, then we have uh, getting staff and volunteers. So it's a good thing to be network networking proactively. Uh, that means things like encouraging outreach activities, uh, engaging in outreach activities, sorry, to uh, boost visibility and awareness, and also approaching other groups and organizations for help and, help and contact. Sometimes there's more that out there than people realize is out there to help, and it's just knowing who to approach and get to know the local population for well for bodies of people in the local po population who might actually be able to help out might want to volunteer and so on particularly for example if there's a body of social care students if there isn't then maybe find we're working out strategies to reach a broader demographic of groups that uh, that may possibly volunteer uh, and keeping staff and volunteers uh, we have, again, fostering collaboration and communication skills in the personnel uh, is is a very good thing to do to create a healthy and effective working environment. Uh, planning ahead strategies to help maintain satisfaction and enjoyment of staff and volunteers to avoid burnout. Uh, so planning is, can be essential to avoiding uh, yes burnout or the uh, dissatisfaction of staff and volunteers. And if possible, it's hard to get away from the, the fact that, uh, yes, we found that financial support for staff roles and for volunteers as well was quite a key factor in people feeling secure and valued. Uh, in getting the support of other organisations, we had uh, we found that, uh, yeah, focusing on raising awareness and communicating the value uh, to professionals, but also the community uh, and involving people where possible was quite key. Uh, using the physical location, whether that's the venue or the neighbourhood, as an opportunity to build links with others. 
and avoiding conflict with other organizations and minimizing overlap to in, in, and involving other organizations and offering them something of benefit was quite key to getting other people's support. Then in keeping the support, maintaining constant contact and information sharing uh, with collaborating organizations, uh, seeking authoritative external advice on overcoming differences in organizational culture and upskilling staff collaboration. And that can be very difficult to do, but I know that um, for certainly for really small groups who, who maybe don't have any expertise in 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 certain things or, or or larger organizations who are used to working in a particular way having a third party you can come in and say well here's what we found has worked that might be a good idea and again taking time to formally plan how collaboration will work so that you head off any potential problems uh, finally getting funding and income and keeping funding and income while well, getting funding is uh, it's always the elephant in the room funding this is absolutely essential i know um and it really all we can say here is things that maximize your chances because of course funding is hard to come by and even more hard to come by in these particular times and um and yes it's there is no easy answer to it so but something again that we consistently found was that ensuring the communication about what the intervention does and its value is absolutely key and this is one of the things that people can quite easily assume that people know what the service is or what the group is or what the activity is that you're doing but if people don't and it's not explained then it can be very easy for people just to assume it's one thing when it's actually the other or assume it's not relevant to them when it actually it is and that includes funders as well so actually communicating what the what what you do and what the value of what you do is is absolutely essential for funders and then there's a uh, building social cal capital that's forging partnerships with other community organizations that can actually be a good thing to do to get funding for multiple reasons and one is is that funders like that they like to see that that is happening another reason is that it can reduce costs and it can and so you can go to the funders and they can see that they they're going to get more value for money um, another thing is that you are more likely to learn of funding opportunities and uh, share best practice in how to get funding in the first place. So that's something that's that's absolutely essential. And then again, learning how to effectively plan a network to help find funding. That's linked to that. Then in keeping funding, we have planning a long term strategy to build a portfolio of multiple income streams that are flexible in terms of what they contribute to paying for. So lots of different things and not just one. Uh, ensuring someone has the time and expertise to continually seek and apply for funding, that's particularly difficult for smaller uh, organizations. And funders, we don't want to just make, I, I should say all these recommendations are aimed at people in practice, but we are also going to make recommendations to funders and commissioners. And one of them we can say to funders is that providing longer term funding to support what is already being done, uh, will help retain and develop deep learning and practice how, on how to best meet local need because of course short-term funding is just it can be uh, absolutely the wrong thing for sustainability in that you, you end up having lots of new things starting and getting funded and then just not supported to go forward so that's something that we will definitely be recommending longer term funding is essential it can't all just be short term um, Yes, so uh, that's it. So the Skydem project is due to complete in uh, December 2020. Uh, we're very grateful to the Alzheimer's Society for funding it and the Skydem Sky project team is there. And that's a little bit about us at the ADS. And for more information, yes, please do get in touch. There's a Skydem blog uh, at that address and there's my email address as well. And yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch, then yeah, then please do. Thank you very much, Thomas. I, was, um, I, was, I found that absolutely comp compelling listening and, you know, thinking about the uh, Meeting Centre support programme. And uh, just as a comment, uh, we are working up a paper where we're using the Skydem project as a framework to look at the impact uh, of COVID on, on uh, meeting centres and those different aspects that Thomas has spoken about. Now, I had um, hoped that there'd be some questions in the chat pane, but there aren't. But if anybody's got uh, a burning question or comment or observation, we'd be very happy.
uh, happy to take them and uh, you could obviously uh, if you'd like to open up your mic and and if anybody's got a question at all according to my screen the chat has been disabled ah oh right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. Has anybody? Well, uh, I, it's probably a bit late to do anything about that now. Um, I think we had this before. I don't know why. Has anybody got any questions then? If they'd like to come come forward now. It's early. It's Dave Trigger. I wonder if uh, I could ask Thomas about the use of virtual meetings. We we're in the middle of one, and we've just shown how difficult they can be. But I, you mentioned the problems with transport and all the rest of it. Of course, yeah. in rural Worcester, show we don't have transport. We we have bicycles very often, and it's a it is a big problem in communicating with groups of people uh, at the at the moment, certainly. But in, even in the long term, I can see that virtual meetings are going to be used more and more and more. I do think, yeah. The the one thing I should say is that uh yeah the, the, when we when we first designed skydem of course we didn't include virtual meetings in what we were looking at uh we were just look we were specifically looking at groups which met face to face uh i think with the covid uh period i think that has made it absolutely clear that yeah we need to look at virtual meetings because of course that's the, that's the really interesting thing that you know that has happened is a lot of groups have expanded into virtual territory where they didn't do that before and that what's really what i find massively fascinating about that is that groups these kind of virtual networks wouldn't have existed without the original face to face group so it's almost like it's a i think there's there's lots to be looked at in that and i think that's i think that's what we would like to do if we do hopefully get funding to do uh do a a, a study taking skydem forward into looking at actual groups is to look at the interplay between you know what's you know, how you do things virtually and how you uh and the physically meeting group and how those two things can kind of work side by side or you know is one better than the other in certain circumstances it's uh but yes yeah. i'm afraid i can't say much on that at the moment i'm afraid because we i say we didn't look at virtual meetings then but that's just become so key during the whole lockdown period i know so, uh, yeah yeah we've been looking at that in in some depth and looking at uh, as we move forward uh, well in any case a blended approach uh so some of the, some of the meeting centers and other organizations have been uh obviously running online meetings but also providing other support um using technology mm. and not using and using non-technology as well uh, and that as we've moved forward that's you know come from being sort of quite extensive use of newsletters newspapers and such like really really important as well because under we found under 50 percent of people are technology enabled or digit have, have the skills and or the technology to engage in in online people in meeting centers probably something around 40 percent so as we move forward hopefully for example leinster meeting center reopening uh next week i don't know what boris has been saying this lunch uh, lunch time <laughs> but um hopefully we will uh and looking at that and and then keeping the use of technology going so that if uh, we have a second wave then people uh have have the the kit and the skills to do it and actually we found that you know during this period actually getting the equipment is not so difficult there's funding for that but it's actually you know supporting people to use it um so yeah that was me has anybody else got a question i do apologize about that chat pain i've got a feeling that happened last time so i just didn't keep my eye on the ball there uh, if anybody else? <coughs> no? Okay, well, we're just coming up to one o'clock, and I'd like to thank uh, Thomas, particularly yeah. for his presentation, and also to you all for coming. We had uh, uh, 39 people here today, so it's absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, you've got Thomas's con uh, contact details on the screen if you need to, got any questions for him, and we'll make uh, the slides and the recording. Uh, available for people yes. to look at yep. afterwards and uh, we won't have a bring your own lunch in august uh, but we will be having one uh, in september so we look forward to seeing uh, you then and wish you a, a very pleasant weekend and thank you for your time
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank